right, thank you guys for coming. My name is Nate Starbard. I've been with Gusmer for about one year now. I'm the product manager in charge of cartridges and also some of the laboratory products that are like the microbiology products. Uh, prior to that, I worked for Millipore for about seven years in charge of their food and beverage uh, division. And before that, I was with Gallo managing their final bottling filtration and uh, doing some R&D work in filtration. So my whole career has been with cartridge filters and filtration. Uh, so if you ever have any questions, I'll have some cards. I think I have some cards up there. Feel free to give me a call if you ever need anything uh, with regards to filtration. It's really what I, what I do. So this presentation today, it kind of keeps with the theme of the, uh, of the rest of the sessions that we've had. It focuses on quality assurance, and really quality assurance is the one, uh, is the only way to truly uh, protect your final product, the only way to guarantee quality assurance is through a final membrane filter. The presentation today will start with an overview of the filter types and differences, the membrane differences. It goes into the total cost of filtration after that. And really the presentation focuses a lot on the total cost of filtration because in addition to ensuring the final product safety, cartridge filtration is an expensive process. Those filters are fairly expensive, so we want to make sure you get as much throughput as possible out of the filters. And throughout the presentation, there's a lot of points and a lot of bullet points that I make to try to extend your throughput go into uh, optimization, operation, you'll find that operating cartridge filtration process, once it's all dialed in, once you uh, figure out how to maximize those throughputs, is actually pretty easy. You don't need an operator standing there. It doesn't take a lot of hands-on work. It's just really the upfront setting it up and getting everything working. Uh, cleaning and sterilization is important. If you don't clean and sterilize the filter right, not only will you not get the throughput that you want, but you'll also have difficulty or you won't be able to get that final micro sterility, which is the whole point of the, the membrane filtration in and of itself. The way that it guarantees product safety is by being integrity testable. We get a lot of questions with customer, from customers, especially now uh, with the rise of cross-flow filters that are marketed oftentimes with a 0.1 or a 0.2 micron filter. People ask why those aren't uh, retentive, why we can't use those to uh, ensure product sterility. The reason being those membranes, even though they're made with the same material, aren't integrity testable. Only a final cartridge is integrity testable, and so it's the only one that you can have that guaranteed uh, reliability of. And then what happens to do if you fail an integrity test? So there's two main types, and they look very much similar. You can see here on, on the left hand, I have a pre-filter. On the right hand, I have a final filter. Uh, different types that are used. The one on the left, the pre-filter, actually matches up with this uh, filter here. It's a uh, mixed, it's a polypropylene fiber filter. It's uh, kind of like a bowl of spaghetti. It's a thick and torturous path of just various wraps of polypropylene. On the right hand side is a membrane. Now, a lot of people, when they think of a membrane, they think it's a sheet of plastic with little holes drilled into it. It looks almost like a mesh. But as you can see, it's more like a sponge material. It uh, doesn't remove all particles at its surface, as people think. It's not just a surface filter, but it does have a depth. The average depth of a membrane is between 200 microns and 250 microns. So if you figure a bacteria is half a micron, it actually has to travel through about uh, 400 times its depth to get through that filter. And it can be retained not just at the surface, but throughout the depth of the, of the filter itself. So most people are surprised when they see that SEM. It's not what they expected of a membrane. They expected something more like this, this representation here where it just has uniform holes in it. Uh, now the main thing with a membrane filter, it has the retention that's needed to ensure micro uh, sterility of the product. It has a rigid structure and there's no particle unloading. Most pre-filters, uh, especially those that are wrapped, will have some type of uh, particle unloading if they're hit with a, a high pressure shock or as they get plugged. Uh, and it is possible to have some growth through with uh, pre-filters. With membrane filters, as long as it's integrity tested, as long as it's working, there can be no growth through, there can be no passage of those microbes from the upstream down to the, to the downstream portion of the process, regardless of the pressure. Either a filter's integral or it's not integral. If it's integral, it's performing its job in removing those particles. The big problem with membrane filters, though, of course, is that uh, as they're just a thin piece of plastic, they uh, don't have a very high holding capacity. You don't want a membrane filter to do the, do the perf to, to do the majority of your uh, final filtration. You want the membrane filter just to be there as the final QA guarantor of ster sterility. You want all of the bulk particles to be removed upstream, either in the clarification process, which you've already seen by now in uh, Calvin and, and the other uh, presentation on uh, wine preparation, or you want the pre-filter to be removing those particles. We ideally recommend that for, if you look at your um, uh, your pre-filter usage versus your final filter usage, you should be using about twice as many pre-filters as your final filters. You want a two to one ratio. You don't want the membrane filter to be using, or to be doing the bulk of that um, filtration. If you have a one to one ratio, then there's probably something we can look at. Either you're not using the right pre-filter, you need to tighten that down, 
or uh, there's something that is going on that affects the membrane worse than the pre-filter. Usually those types of things are poor cleaning processes and poor uh, water that's used for sanitation and sterility. So those are two areas that we commonly look at if a customer does have a one-to-one -one ratio. You really want the bulk of the, pre of the filtration to be performed at the pre-filter step. It's a picture made by my predecessor's kid at Millipore, just kind of shows it again. You want the tree to be the depth filter. You want uh, that to remove the bulk of the particles. The membrane is just there to pick up those extra stray microbes that get through the rest of the process. You don't want that membrane being overloaded. With regards to pore size, uh, so the PVDF filter that we use, the Vitapore 2 Plus from Millipore, is available in 0.1 all the way up to 1.0 micron pore sizes. Uh, 1.0 micron in the wine industry is commonly used for brett removal. Uh, now, I know there's been a lot of studies recently, some work done by Charlie Edwards up in the University of Washington that has shown that certain brett can be seen downstream of 1.0 micron filter, but in all of those studies and all of those instances, uh, the brett was never seen to be viable. So even though you may be able to see a cell downstream, it's so stressed and it's shedded so much water that it, it's shrunk to pass through the filter, but it won't grow and it doesn't uh, pose a quality concern. So we can still reliably sell, say that a 1.0 micron membrane does reliably protect the wine from uh, Britannomyces, even though in certain rare instances, mostly in the laboratory, they have been able to pass non-viable brett through a 1.0 micron. Yeast is removed completely by a 0.65 micron filter. Uh, now there's a bit of a disconnect between the wine and beer industry and, and uh, the rest of the filtration world. If you look on the internet, if you look at literature from another industry, you'll hear sterilizing grade and that goes to a 0.2 micron filter. The rest of industries, bottled water, soft drinks, um, sports drinks, energy drinks, those types of uh, products and most importantly pharmaceuticals, when they say sterilizing grade, they're talking about a 0.2 micron filter that removes all bacteria and all, all uh, yeast and contaminants other than virus. In the wine industry, you say sterilizing grade, you're actually referring to a 0.45 micron filter, which is unique to, to wine and beer. And the reason being that it removes um, the, part, the products of concern for those industries. So it is essentially sterilizing grade for those industries. Sorry, go ahead. A mold is very large. Mold is, is removed well above one micron. So any, any of these filters would, would completely remove mold. Uh, and then at the lower end of the scale, so the tightest membrane cartridge that you can get is 0.1 micron, and that's used uh, for virus clearance in pharmaceutical. Of course, the most important thing of, uh, of running your filtration process is to make sure the filters don't plug. You want the maximum throughput uh, through those filters as possible. The main things that determine that are the quality and filterability of the feed, which the type of the filter used, the membrane, uh, the cartridge that's actually used, and then most people overlook the speed and the flow rate that a process is run. Uh, 10,000 gallons filtered at 10 gallons per minute will have a much higher throughput overall over the life of the filter than 10,000 gallons filtered at 20 gallons per minute. That actually does have a big impact. It's not just the batch size, it's the flow rate at which that uh, batch is processed through the filter. And that has to do with the way the deformable particles, they blind off the membrane and they, they start to plug more of that upstream rather than the, the middle and the downstream portion of the filter. So you're saying if I have like a five round housing and all the line constant flow constant in that housing be equal, I substituted a 10 round in there, the filters would last longer. Yes. So it, you'll actually get almost like a, a free filter benefit out of there. So we have a lot of customers because filters are only available in one round, three round, five round, eight round, and then the gaps start getting larger as you get bigger. They uh, after a 12 round, you go to 18 and then a 24 round. So oftentimes customers are stuck if they're trying to optimize their flow rate between two housing sizes and they have to either round up or round down. If you're, for instance, between a one and a three round, which is the decision most customers have to make, if you go, if you size to the three round instead of the one round, you'll actually change that filter housing or those filters out about four times less often, not three times less often. You'd figure a one to three, you'd get triple the throughput. You'll actually get closer to four times the throughput. So you do get a free filter benefit. It costs more to set it up, but you're getting more throughput per each cartridge and you'll save money long run. So that, that's something that's often, often overlooked. It's not just batch size. Uh, when you're running the process, really there's one variable to watch and that's the pressure drop. Pressure drop directly relates to, and when we say pressure drop, we mean differential pressure, the in minus the out. And that uh, directly relates to the amount of plugging of a filter. Filter, like a membrane, typically starts at about half a pound differential and ends, it's fully plugged at 40 pounds differential. Uh, most people, they start to lose flow between 32 and 35, depend, depending on the uh, bottling operation. So you have to either have to change or clean the filters then, or you have to run your filler slower in order to, to keep up with the flow. So various processes, various people will run the filters until between 32 and 40 pounds. 
Uh, one thing to note about pressure drop too, you have to be careful when you're nearing the end of that pressure drop when you're around 27, 28, because the last bit of pressure drop increases exponentially. It may take many thousands of gallons to get that first 25, 27 pounds differential, and then a tenth of that amount to get that last seven pounds, it really starts to take off. So you need to be mindful when your process really starts to get well into the, the realm of the filters being plugged to either take them down or clean them, or just be aware that the filters may plug and not make it through the, uh, the rest of that batch. The way you delay filter plugging, the way you increase your throughput, consistent, slower operation, proper feed preparation, uh, controlling the water quality, that, that is uh, one of the most important things. Outside of temperatures during cleaning, which we get into a lot later on, you really want to control the water quality. You want to use filtered, softened water uh, to do your CIP and sterilization. There have actually been many instances where we've done filterabilities on both wine and water at a customer site. The water has a higher plugging index than the, the wine itself does. People think because water looks clear, um, it's, it's going to be easier to filter than wine, but that's not always the case, especially with a lot of muni waters. People also think typically that well water is going to be worse because it's coming right from the ground, the muni waters. A lot of city water supplies are much, much more, much less filterable and much more difficult for a process than even well water. And a lot of that has to do with the dissolved materials, the, uh, the, the, the minerals and the inorganics that are present in the water that will gradually build up over the filters over time and can't really be removed outside of a couple special cleaning processes. So controlling water quality, Really softeners is the key way to do that. Softeners, which are a couple few hundred dollars for, for tanks that are used throughout many industries, uh, will uh, get you about 80% of the way there. That'll clean up your water about 80% to where it should be. And then you can add a filter upstream too to kind of deflect the rest of the contaminants to the water filtration, which is less of a critical area, as opposed to plugging up bottling filters where you have to worry about wine loss and you have to worry about bottling downtime. So a lot of people now are starting to put filters out towards their water process just to, to, to um, pick up that little extra bit of plugging materials that comes from the water. So that can be very important. And then cleaning regimens. There's a whole section coming up on cleaning. That is the other important thing on getting the maximum throughput out of your filters. A couple pictures of Millipore's manufacturing up in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, where the cartridges are made. Uh, one thing to know, so Millipore is a pharmaceutical company. They supply, they're the world's leader for cartridges in the pharmaceutical market, and it's the same filter that you're using for wine that's used in pharmaceuticals with the PVDF membrane. The PVDF membrane is so successful for new cancer drugs, for um, antibodies, for all of the, the modern therapeutics because it has low protein binding. In pharmaceutical, the protein is the product. So if you have lower protein binding, you have higher yields of a product that's worth millions of dollars. The benefit in the wine industry, having that lower protein binding means there's fewer proteins on the membrane when it's time to uh, clean, and then there's fewer proteins permanently baked on that causes a reduction of filterability. So it's the same exact membrane manufactured in the, on the same lines in the same pharmaceutical clean room. I think in the next slide, you can kind of see somebody there in a, in a space suit behind it. So these cartridges are actually made to pharmaceutical standards in a pharmaceutical clean room, which is a little bit unique. And it's one of the reasons why Gusmer and Millipore have such a good partnership. Millipore is a pharma company. We're a beverage company. So we allow their products to be taken into, into an additional industry where their sales force isn't focused. So points on the membranes. Uh, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a lot of different membranes used in the wine industry. You had cellulose acetate, you had nylon, you had uh, some track etch. There was, there was a variety of membranes. Now the industry is pretty much boiled down to two membranes. Uh, Millipore, since their pharmaceutical business is so large, is pretty much the only company that offers a PVDF filter. I believe it's the only PVDF for the wine industry. And uh, that's the one that we represent that we think is the best for the wine industry. Even though Millipore does have PES filters, PES filters are heavily used in, in visine, contact solutions, things like that, that that Millipore does, but we prefer to stick with the PVDF because of that protein binding. Uh, most other competitors uh, have now gone to a PES filter. I don't think there's anybody with a cellulose acetate or a, or a nylon membrane out there anymore. Even though they look alike, the cartridges look alike, and uh, they're still essentially the same flat sheet of plastic, they're very different. They, they're, their shape is different, their symmetry is different, the surface treatments are different, the binding is different. There's a lot of differences uh, within the membranes that a lot of times people don't uh, don't realize that they're so different. Here's a cross section of the two different membranes. So when we talk about symmetry and we say asymmetric versus symmetric, the PES filter on the left is an asymmetric membrane. There's essentially just void volume for much of the th thickness of the membrane. And this is a cross section. So if you were to look at the uh, membrane from the side, this depth is about 200 to 250 microns. The P PVDF has a consistent depth throughout that has the same pore size and the same retention. The PES has a, a large void volume upstream, and just the final portion, just the final quarter or so, actually has membrane that's at that retention that it's rated at. So that has uh, several implications as far as uh, stress tolerance, um, surface tension, 
So this filter has a, a very difficult time filtering a lot of, I doubt up in this area, actually I, I see a couple people in this area that might, might be uh, filtering wine coolers, flavored champagnes, uh, specialty products like that. Those are very difficult to filter with PES because the oils and the flavorings of, of uh, those products change the surface tension of the P PES filter and then they don't allow for a reliable integrity test. These filters are actually more difficult to get a reliable integrity test on just in general because integrity tests are all built around the ability for a specific membrane to retain water. Only this bottom portion retains water at the specifications for this membrane. This portion, while it may retain water, it's at a different bubble point, it's at a different diffusion, it's completely different. So that means you have, it's much easier to have a false failure, a false positive when integrity testing PES membrane. The other issue is that's why you can't get a 1.0 micron PES membrane. As this void volume gets bigger, as the pores get bigger, when you go up to, uh, this is a 0.45, when you go up to a 0.65 and then a, point, a 1.0, you can imagine this area doesn't offer much stress resistance. This membrane is constantly flexing back and forth. Having this open volume would lead to cracking of this small amount. This is why our filter is the only one that's a 1.0 micron. I think we already touched on that. Now the one issue though is chemical stability. So a uh, PES uh, membrane is chemically compatible because of its surface treatment with caustic. PVDF filter, uh, you can't run caustic through it in any large quantities because it'll break down that surface treatment. So that surface treatment on the PVDF filter that uh, causes it to have low protein binding and a higher throughput uh, will get broken down by caustic. There's no risk to your product if that happens. The membrane's still retentive. It just makes it much more difficult to integrity test because that surface treatment also makes it hydrophilic, which means it accepts water. Um, but any other common chemicals, paracetic acid, um, hot water is usually the best cleaning agent. Those are compatible with either membrane. I thought I... Yeah, how, what, um, how compatible are these with housing units? Um, with housing units? Yeah, so, so for example, if you, you, you so have to specifically have a, um, a mill for a housing unit. You know, so so you, how universal are, are the sizes? completely universal. So they all have the same, so this is a code seven. Um, a couple, most manufacturers call this code seven, a couple call it a different thing, but the design, the 226 O-ring and the locking tab for this one is the same across every manufacturer. This is probably 90% of the industry now. Um, this one is an older code five, so it's, it has a smaller O-ring and it uh, doesn't have the tabs. But uh, in general, every manufacturer offers every single code. So that's, you can uh, use anybody in anybody else's housing. So again, the summary of, of PVDF, and it really all uh, goes into the total cost of filtration. So looking at the total cost of filtration is something that we you know, really try to get a customer to think in terms of. And that means that you don't just look at the filter purchase costs, you have to look at the throughput, which you know, directly relates to the filter purchase costs. If you spend 10% more on a filter that gets 20% more throughput, your filter purchase costs over the course of a year are 10% lower. But the other costs are actually usually as significant or more significant of the filter purchase costs themselves. Uh, wine loss, this is a smaller housing, but you can imagine as you get into a three, five, 12 round, there's quite a bit of wine that's usually lost every time that filter is plugged, every time that filter needs to be changed out or, or cleaned. Uh, also, bottling downtime. I know a lot of the larger bottling houses factored in a, a dollar value of bottling downtime at about $6 a minute. That takes into consideration they have specialized operators that are tied to bottling that typically don't work elsewhere. Like a smaller winery may have other, other uh, uses for the operators, whereas a larger winery, it's 24-5, <coughs> or 24-7 bottling. Those operators are dedicated to bottling. You have the conveyor belts running, pumps running, lights on, soap going on the conveyor. All those costs added together works out to about $6 a minute. So you want to minimize the amount of plugings, the amount of changeovers, and the amount of downtime to your bottling, not just for those costs, but just to meet your bottling attainments. So there's, uh, I think we have it on the next slide, uh, utilities. I know in this area, water is a huge issue. The fewer cleanings, the fewer plugings you have, the lower your water usage. I know some of the wineries in this area are putting in buffer tanks for their water because they have to meter their flow out to the POTW. They have to reduce that flow. And uh, more and more people are trying to land apply and, and really be creative rather than send stuff to POTW because permits are getting strict and water usage is getting uh, tough. That was a question back the back of the says less binding with protein and column first two types of membrane, is that because the coatings, the other ones have an affinity to bind the, the, the different uh, proteins in the, uh, and the uh, pigments on the, the surface as opposed to this uh, PVDF? Is it, is it so, something, why, why is it less, less removable? 
both it's both the material and it's and it's the uh, the surface treatment. So every membrane, every plastic, essentially, but especially membranes, they have an affinity for protein. Every, every membrane will bind some amount of protein. PVDF is significantly orders of magnitude less than PES. Uh, the worst one back in I don't think anybody's using about five or seven years was uh, nylon. Larger nylon housings would bind so much protein it would look like water coming out of the first run. You'd have to just run the first amount. Not only does that, um, and typically with the mixing and the larger filler bowls, you're not going to see a degradation of product there due to that, that amount of binding. Where you really get hurt is in terms of the throughput because that binding of material on the membrane then gets baked on and stays on after the cleaning process and uh, causes your filter to not get as much throughput through it. So it's not as much a quality concern as a, as a throughput concern. Uh, these ones don't have a zeta charge. That that's uh, a separate property on depth filters. So your your cellulose, lenticulars, and sheets. That. No, it did completely different processes. These ones don't have any kind of zeta or positive charge to. Uh, so lenticulars and sheets want that because it helps to remove well, yeah, certain particles. These. Control, you know, no, it's. Sure. No, in this instance, just chemical binding. It's the same thing with any plastic has a slight affinity for, or proteins actually have the affinity for the, for the uh, plastic material. This just allows the, the proteins and the color to pass through the membrane without laying on the surface of the Correct. material. Correct. Correct. Yep. But no matter how you look at uh, the total cost of filtration, really throughput, how many gallons you're getting per change out is the key metric. Everybody should know exactly how many gallons on a rolling basis they're getting through each uh, change out. What we recommend with a Vitapor 230 inch preceded by a BevyGuard M pre filter, you should get about 100,000 gallons minimum through that 30 inch filter. When you scale that up to a 12 round, you're looking at about 1 million gallons for a 12 round. That's really where we like to see customers. We have some customers who've super optimized and really do a lot of specialty cleaning processes that are getting 3 million gallons reliably through a 12 round. And that, that's pretty extraordinary, but you can see the, the capacity for optimization. A lot of customers are down around 50,000. If you can even get up to 200, 250,000 uh, gallons per, uh, per filter, then not only are you reducing your filter purchase cost by four times, you're reducing your wine loss, your bottling downtime, all of those other things that go into the total cost of filtration. So there's actually a huge capacity for optimization with specialty cleaning and with, uh, with some other things that we'll go into later on. The other big point, other than throughput, directly offsetting filter costs, the total cost of filtration is, of course, quality. One single quality instance, especially up here, you're going to, one, one small hold, you go through about 10 to 15 years worth of filter purchase costs in, in uh, wine. I mean, there's really nothing more damaging than a QA incident. And of course, each situation is going to be a little bit different. We, we calculate the total cost of filtration for different customers. We look at it. I, I've got some spreadsheets that calculate out the, uh, the electrical costs in the area, the uh, average operator labor usage, and you know, detailed calculations, how you value the liquid wine. So each situation is going to be different. But in general, you're looking at these costs are going to meet or beat the cost of filter purchasing. Even though we say filters are expensive and we know everybody wants to get the throughput, it's important to put it into perspective of the other, co of the other cost of an operation, though. If you are getting 100,000 gallons per 30-inch filter, that actually works out to $0.004 per gallon, which is $0.008 cents, uh, per bottle. That's lower than labeling costs. So the cost to filter that, that product and the benefits of having a sterile product that you don't have to worry about uh, any, any quality incidents on is actually cheaper than the label. It's, it's really the cheapest quality or the cheapest process step uh, throughout the winemaking process. So even though filters get a lot of attention and those filters are expensive and we realize that, you know, put into perspective, it's much cheaper than centrifuge, it's, it's cheaper than DE, it's cheaper than labeling even. Now, ideally, we recommend people to size at six to 10 gallons per minute and per 30 inch. And this goes back to that uh, velocity and that speed of filtering point made earlier. Uh, realistically, this filter, the Vitaport 2, can handle upwards of around 15 to 20 gallons per minute flow. But if you do that, then you're going to hurt your economics long term. Uh, these is, this is the uh, chart, roughly, where most housings fall into. You know, unfortunately, you do have to pick a lot of times. You're right on the border. You have to pick between a 1 and a 3 or a 3 and a 5. Uh, usually, we recommend that you size larger because you're going to get that added bonus of, of uh, throughput per cartridge long run. Uh, the wine industry is a little bit unique in that they like to size the final filter the same size as the pre-filter. It has some benefits in that you have the same numbers, you have the same spare parts, you have the same size gaskets and O-rings. Uh, but since you want that pre-filter to do the majority of the filtration, and since that pre-filter should be 
you should be going through two pre-filters for every one final filter. Typically, the pre-filter housing should be larger to minimize the number of change-outs. You don't want to be changing that pre-filter out too often because it doesn't matter if it's the pre-filter or final filter that plugs. If either plugs, your bottling shut down if you don't have uh, parallel skids. So usually, in a well-optimized process, it's better to have a larger pre-filter than a final filter. And then uh, clarification in other housings, usually we, we look at the filterability, we look at the product, and then we size on a special case there. One of the things that's finally gaining ground in the wine industry that's used in other industries and I, and I think is a, a great thing and economically will usually pay for itself within a month or two months is to use parallel or dual filtration skids. So in this you have a, a single inlet and a single outlet down to the filler, but you have two separate pre-filters and two separate final filters that are tied together in their own skids. They're able to be cleaned and sanitized independently so that way, let's say this top right final filter plugs up, rather than shut the bottling line down, you simply switch over to the next set, continue running, and there's no negative downtime to bottling. And then that allows you to do a much more detailed uh, and, and longer cleaning cycle, more efficient cleaning cycle, to clean these filters and to not have any bottling downtime. This also lets customers to default to cleaning more often than changing it out. A lot of, if you're halfway through a filtration run, you've got wine on the line, and this filter plugs, most people are gonna automatically go to changing that filter out, putting in a fresh one, because then you know you'll get through the rest of that run. You're not gonna try to clean that filter and risk plugging up again just a few hours later. So if you have these two skids, your first inclination can be to clean that filter, which sometimes you can clean that filter, knock 10, 20 PSI off the differential pressure and get a lot more throughput through it. So this allows you to, to be a lot more liberal with your cleaning processes rather than just change those filters out and not maximize the throughput per filter. So this is a process that you know, for the low cost of housings, you, you not only eliminate your downtime, but you allow much lower filter purchase costs over time. And it also allows for specialty cleaning cycles, citric acid rinses to remove um, materials that are deposited from water, uh, specialized enzymes. Some people will put beta-glucanase or other enzymes in the housings, let them soak, and then that'll help to clean those materials. And it really allows you to stretch out your cold and warm water rinses during your cleaning, which has a, a huge effect on, on uh, removing proteins before they're baked on in the hot water step. What's the best way to isolate them? So you want to sanitize one set and you're running on the other set. Valves or disconnect? Uh, usually valves because then I mean, you can get a three-way valve here. Uh, it depends. Each setup is going to be a little bit different. The key thing is to make sure that they're able to be independently sterilized and cleaned because otherwise you can't you know, take them both offline. So there, there's a variety of ways of, of plumbing that together. You just want to make sure you're minimizing dead legs and that every area that would be opened is, is clean before you, you start running on the next one. The question is, is there a rule of thumb to size your pre filter to the filter to the final filter? Usually, you size based on your final fil filter first. So, you take your flow rate, you size the final filter. Ideally, you'll size that, that pre filter the next size up. So, if you're a three round on your final filter, you'd be a five round on your pre filter. It works out to where it's almost a, a two to one, or a 50% rather larger uh, surface area of your pre filter. You build, you build these skits, right? So, if anyone ever wanted to build something, they could contact you and you have some ideas on the payout and stuff like that. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with these kids, so. If you ever want to. <clears throat> from, a, from a filter storage standpoint, once you wet the filter, mm -hmm. how long can you keep it uh, isolated before you have to run something through it? Before the filter starts to, <clears throat> to uh, break down or degrade? Um, usually it depends on the wine, the winery, and then uh, how confident you are in the system. Uh, so some people will, will put a two hour spec on that, other people will leave it over the weekend and, and come up fine on it. Uh, there's a couple things you can do to, to ensure that, such as keeping positive pressure on the housing, so you do dose in some nitrogen on the housing after you sterilize it. it make sure it's sterile nitrogen and that keeps a positive pressure, so that helps maintain the sterility longer. Um, really depends on the cleaning process and, and how it's isolated, but if it's a fully closed system, then you, know, you, you can leave it for, for a decent amount of time. Most people, when they're running the dual filtration skids, will watch the differential pressure. When the differential pressure gets around 22, 23, they'll sanitize the next set. And then when that first set goes, they, they have that one ready to go. But if, if it takes three or four or five hours to hit that, you're, you're going to be fine. What about from a, like a store standpoint? So you CIP it, um, you've already run wine through, you CIP it, and then you've got liquid in there, water, whatnot. Okay. Um, I've heard that they can cake, the filters can, can uh, basically rot. <coughs> no, that, that can't happen. Uh, even if it dries out and re-wets, then that, with uh, certain membranes like reverse osmosis membranes and some, some specialty membranes, ultrafilter membranes, that can happen, but with these, that, that's not a concern. Okay. Uh, 
So once you get the system designed, once you're up and running, uh, once you have your CIP system, really the CIP system and, and how to sanitize the filters, that's actually the complicated part of, of designing the system, making sure there's no dead legs, making sure there's no, uh, no issues there. Once it's up and running, all designed, there's really just two points. You want to monitor your differential pressure and you want to track your gallons throughput. The other important thing to note that's becoming more and more important now, especially with the white wines, Used to be no white wines were carbonated, maybe they were carbonated at 50 ppm. Now with the Moscatos and a lot of the specialty products, a lot of wines are up around 50, or upwards of 1500 ppm in some cases. They're heavily carbonated. When you have hot temperatures, what that does is that the CO2 will come out of solution. And the CO2, this is usually the high point of any process, the top of the housing dome. CO2 starts to make a bubble here. That bubble gradually overlaps the cartridges. And then if it overlaps the cartridges, you're not getting any wine flow through there. So you're not using the entire surface area of the cartridge. It's not uncommon for us to have a customer send a filter back. The top element is perfectly white. Looks like it just came out of the bag. The bottom two elements are red and dirty and clean. So in that instance, they're using only two thirds, some cases one third of the, of the, uh, of the filter. So it's important to always vent. This is nice housing where it has a sight glass. That's not always the case. Uh, a quick way to walk through a plant and look if the filters are vented, if the condensate line is down here, you know that the air bubble is probably right around that condensate line. And it's not uncommon for us to do filter audits, walk through a facility and, and notice the condensate lines anywhere midway up, up or down the housing. Uh, the other good point about, the other thing to remember about venting the housings is uh, in the wine industry, you're used to dealing with a very low dissolved oxygen product. Wine's kept with a low DO. Uh, the water used for CIP has a very high dissolved oxygen content. So you have to be actually extra mindful during your CIP about air bubbles forming. If that air bubble forms, you're not going to uh, reach temperature in the top of this dome. And you may notice the biofilm start to fill up, uh, fill up in this dome. You'll also uh, may not wet out the filters as, as well as you should if you have, because usually the CIP water is the last thing uh, that the filters see before an integrity test. If you have an air bubble uh, during that CIP, that top of the filter won't be wetted out. You'll run your integrity test and then you'll fail that integrity test due to that air bubble. So that's a big cause of failed integrity test. So you always want to make sure, especially if you don't have a sight glass and you can't visually see it, that the housings are vented, not just with product, but also with uh, CIP. But once they're running, you watch the differential pressure and you make sure they're vented. It's pretty simple. It doesn't require an operator to watch it, a lot of hands on time. It's, it's a relatively easy process to run. Then you get into filter cleaning. Optimizing your filter cleaning, that's one of the most important points. And really that's how the next slide shows you the whole principle behind filter cleaning. You, you start to build differential pressure, you clean, you knock down the differential pressure. You start to build it again and you keep doing that and you keep cleaning and it extends your throughput. Rather than having to change the filter out here, you change the filter out here or hopefully even farther. It's the, the whole purpose of, of cleaning the filter. Uh, it also eliminates any flavor or color carryover that you might see between flavored products or between um, you know, red versus a white wine. No cleaning process, though, can completely eliminate cartridges from plugging. Even in bottled water, even in, uh, you know, if putting you, you put a membrane after an RO filter, which is removing everything from the water, uh, filters will still plug. Usually that has to do with bound proteins that are then baked on at a higher temperature. Uh, we have a couple slides on that, but I'll, I'll go into it a little bit now. So the key temperature to monitor for um, cleaning your wine filters is 135 degrees F. Any proteins remaining on the membrane at 135 degrees F or above will get baked onto that membrane and won't be removed after that. And that'll cause a direct loss of filter ability or of filter usage on that filter. So you want to make sure there's as few proteins left on that filter as possible when you hit that 135 degrees and above. Your final cleaning, your sterilization is typically going to be at 180 degrees, um, but 135 degrees is the temperature to watch. How you remove the most proteins is by longer cold water and warm water cycles. The ideal situation is to run a good cold water rinse and then run a warm water rinse or have a long cycle time where your boiler takes time to get up to speed from the ambient water to the hot water. If that ramp up time is 10 or 20 minutes, that 10 or 20 minutes of gradual temperature increase does a really good job at removing the proteins and nothing really does a uh, better job at, at extending the filter throughput than that. We had one customer recently, a good sized customer, who in order to save bottling downtime, did away with their cold and warm water rinse. They figured that the hot water step was the only step that mattered, started recirculating the water in a tub, so that way it was already 180 degrees, put that right through the filters, instantly saw the throughputs go down by half. Started spending double on filters just due to that one uh, situation. So nothing really can, can impact filters more than that. And we know when that's going on. We see the filters come back. Customers will usually call us. They're seeing much different throughputs. They're not sure why. They'll send the filter back. If you cut open and look at that filter, it looks like a glazed pot. There, there's like an enamel on it if you go directly to hot water after uh, filtering, especially you know, heavy red wine. 
So that, that's really one of the main limiting factors of filter cleaning. Uh, also water material, uh, materials from your water source, inorganic silicates, carbonates, things like that. Some of those can be removed by citric acid rinse. A citric acid rinse on the filters or even a, a soak with a small flow rate for a little while, uh, once every two weeks or once a month, does a really good job at knocking off a lot of the materials that are present from water. Uh, it dissolves them away. But that being said, a lot of those materials uh, can never be removed. So once they're on the membrane, they're on the membrane. But a, a citric acid rinse will help that. But these two things together can never be completely eliminated. And even in the best process, will gradually plug your, your membrane filter. We actually can run, you guys, yeah, it was the last session of the day, so you'd have already seen uh, Calvin's presentation on filterability of the wine. We've actually run those filterabilities on water as well. Uh, typically, just putting a softener in there that's a couple, few hundred dollars will get you about 80% of the way. That does a real good job at, at uh, cleaning up the majority of these types of materials. You can put a filter up there as well, and then that just, that doesn't necessarily, that cleans up the water, but what it more does, because that filter has a cost, is it deflects the costs away from the final bottler and make sure that you're changing that filter out outside of bottling and wine loss so it reduces your total cost of filtration by, by pushing those elsewhere. Um, but there's also some water analysis that can be done to look at if there's any silicates or carbonates. There's uh, some quick little uh, membrane. You can buy the same uh, membranes that are used in the cartridge in small disk format and run it through. And, and uh, there's a silt density index test that's commonly used for industrial plants that are looking at their water quality. And uh, we have protocols for those on our website or we, you know, we're used to helping customers out. So there's a variety of things you can look at to know if you have a, a, a water that is really plugging and, and uh, giving your filters a hard time. Correct. Uh, you, you can reverse clean these filters. So that's, uh, so our Vitaport 2 is the only filter on the market that it can actually be reverse cleaned, but you have to be very careful with that. Reverse direction is the uh, most the most fragile uh, direction for a cartridge to have flow. So if you look at the pressure specifications, uh, at ambient temperature, the pressure specification for this cartridge is 80 in the forward direction. At ambient temperature, that drops to 25 pounds uh, in the reverse direction. At elevated temperature, the forward direction is 25. That drops to 5 pounds in the reverse direction. Those specifications are, are have a big safety factor built into them, but you can also, you can already see where um, especially if you don't do a good cold or warm water rinse, uh, your differential pressure is going to be high when you get to that warm water step. So that's another point where if you're going to reverse clean, you need to do a much more of a cold and warm water rinse in order to drop that differential pressure down to an acceptable le level, 0.5 or, uh, 5 PSID or lower in order to reverse clean. So, but you can reverse clean these filters. We did one uh, large study with a customer not that long ago who reverse cleaned a competitive filter, found out that or went to the competitor wondering why their filters were breaking. And they said, you, know, you reverse clean them. You know, we, we have nothing to do with that. You can't do that. You're, you're on your own. So we did a validation with that customer. And over the period of several lines and several months, they did 50 back flushes. Not one failed. And they've been using it ever since. So it is back flushable. We hesitate a little bit in recommending it because you have to have a good process. You, ha you can't have water hammer. You can't have uh, you know, pressure shocks or, or valves getting slammed open or closed. You have to really watch your process. But if done correctly, it can usually offer 10 to 20% greater throughput, especially if you have any uh, hard particle issues. So reverse cleaning with regards to microbes or carbohydrates, stuff that's broken up or dissolved, really has no benefit. But where it has a benefit is if you have a DE filter prior and those screens can get cracked, you can have bleed through. Uh, if you're doing any kind of carbon up, up front or, or anything <coughs> like that, or even betonite, those types of materials, you do a back flush to drain, you always want to make sure you break your pre and final filter because there's no sense in doing a back flush and then it ends up on the downstream of the pre filter and just keeps bouncing back and forth in there. You want to break that drain, back flush to, to drain, and with hard particles, that does do a very good job of cleaning. So it's something that if you have a DE filter in particular, it, it can be beneficial, but you have to really be mindful of the differential pressure. So, and then to your point on the, uh, the flow rate, we do have a lot of customers, especially now water is more of a concern in Northern California, that try to, that think the, the temperature is what matters and try to eke a half a gallon a minute or one gallon a minute through a housing that's normally run at 20 or 30 gallons a minute. You want to run the same flow rate on your, on your uh, CIP as you run on your cleaning. It's not just about the temperature and it's not just about the time, it's also about the volume. You do need a decent volume of, of uh, water, especially when you're in that warm water step, to do a good job of cleaning the filter. And again, we've already touched on the gradual uh, temperature increase. 
uh, is usually a, is a much better way to go. Most customers have a system where it takes 10 to 20 minutes for the same water line to go from ambient temperature up to uh, its hot 180 degree temperature, so you get that ramp up time. Some customers, uh, and this isn't very common, but it really does a good job, will actually have a system where you can stop and hold. You can stop and hold and do a 10 minute rinse at 90 degrees, you can stop and hold and then at 120 degrees do a 10 minute rinse, and then you let the temperature increase up to its 180 from there. And that does a significantly better job at cleaning the filters as well. But those types of systems typically aren't very common. I think Yvonne's presentation touched on a lot of the sanitation. Typically a filter is sanitized just the same way as the, the process line. 180 degree water for 30 to 45 minutes. You want to use it to prevent biofilms, to uh, destroy any microbes that are in there. It's both a factor of contact time and temperature. Really the only unique thing to filter housings, uh, you, want, you can't use caustic, um, which most people will sanitize or clean with hot water anyway, and you have to watch this high point in the system. You want to make sure there's no air bubbles that are entrained in there uh, causing a, a, the inability for that water to reach the top of this dome. Other than that, the filters are pretty much sanitized exactly the same way as, uh, as any other step of the process. There's again that, that bullet point on 135 degrees F, really outside of really poor quality wine uh, with regards to filterability, you know, beta-glucan issues, pectin issues, nothing will affect your, your throughput more than immediately hitting wine with a temperature over 100, or filters that have just processed wine with a temperature over 135 degrees F. You really want to be mindful of that. And this is again the uh, influence of temperature on differential specification. Even though we put 80 pounds pressure, that's where all the filter companies have kind of settled on a specification. Every filter pretty much has a specification of 80 pounds. We've tested ours. You don't have any failures up until 120 pounds. So there's generous safety factors built into here, but you also have to be mindful that as that temperature increases, the cartridge as a piece of plastic does get weaker, uh, especially in the reverse direction. Again, we're, we put in the uh, slide on water and cleaning facility. We've Definitely seen facilities that have gotten as much as a 25% decrease in their total filter spend by uh, installing water softeners and uh, putting a filter upstream because now you're loading it on that one filter, then maybe you can do a specialty cleaning on that one filter, regular citric acid rinses that you don't have to do on the several filters or the bottling line that's tied to uh, operators and wine loss and everything else. Uh, hot water uh, sterilization versus steam on the life of the cartridge? Steam should have no impact on the life of the cartridge except if you run into an issue of damaging it. Steam is probably the easiest way to damage a cartridge, but there's a lot of industries like dairy, pharmaceutical that only clean uh, using steam. One of the issues with steam cleaning that you have to be mindful of is steam is a gas. So just like the bubble point, we'll get into a little bit on integrity testing. If that filter's wetted, if you've just run a cleaning or if you've just run wine, that filter's wetted and you apply steam, that steam won't pass through the membrane until uh, it breaks the bubble point, which is 28 PSI on a, uh, on a Vitaport II. So you're going to have a pretty elevated temperature uh, and a really elevated differential pressure. So you have to make sure the condensate's drained. Ideally, the filter will be a little bit uh, dry. It'll be a little bit old. Uh, or there will be have have had some time pass between the cleaning or the wine and when you apply the steam. That's a good uh, best practice. Uh, I think by breaking the curtain, maybe if you exceed <coughs> recommended temperature, you know, two thirty or so. Or or exceeding the temperature. I mean, actually, the the filter, the membrane is compatible up to three hundred twenty degrees Fahrenheit. It's the uh, the pliability of the plastic. You'll see the cartridges might bend with the pressure. You might. Uh, damage it, and you'll catch that in an integrity test. If you have a steam issue, you'll, you will have an integrity test. Whenever somebody goes to steam cleaning, it's pretty rare. Some of the mobile bottlers do it because they're limited on water, uh, and it does a good job at, at hitting all the surfaces. Um, other than that, I would say fewer than 10 wineries that I've seen regularly uh, use any type of steam cleaning. Once you get it dialed in, once you get that process you know, figured out, it's something that can be reliably used. Um, but in that initial installation, it's common for them to come back to us and found out that the condensate hasn't been drained, enough time hasn't passed from a wet step to the steam step to where the cartridge will be damaged. The, you'll see the tabs bent, you'll see the cartridge uh, broken because steam is difficult. The other point I, I'd make on steam is steam, if you don't have to use it, is just an additional step. Steam has no cleaning benefit to the, to the filters. It's just a sterilization step. So if you want to get throughput through the filters, you still have to do a cleaning step. So that steam is essentially just additional time and money that shouldn't be needed versus 180 degree water that's not just sterilizing but it's also cleaning the, wine, the uh, filters. 
What about the chlorine dioxide for sterilization instead? Uh, I don't think chlorine dioxide is recommended for sterilization. It's a good thing for wineries to use for general micro sterility. You know, on your bottle rinsers, a huge benefit. And even just having it around the plant and the plant water as, as operators are pushing corks around with a spray hose, they're also uh, sanitizing and, and hitting the walls with stuff. So it's a good thing. I think for the cost, it's definitely worthwhile for, for a winery to add that to their water. I don't think, though, it's feasible to put it at, the, at a high enough concentration where it's actually a sterilizing agent. Uh, I, if you got really high with it, yeah, you, you would have to worry about that. And, and safety, really. It, it, high concentrations of it can be, can be dangerous, depending. So, but as a general, at around 50 ppm, as a, as a lower level, just general disinfectant in your water, so again, especially on the rinser and it, or in the bottling room, I think it, it does a really good job, and it's a good, good thing to add. It's worthwhile. What about steam as setup for your cartridge then? Steam, sorry, what? That, what about steam for setup? So not cleaning, but setup in the morning. Would you do a uh, rinse cycle and then steam, or would you do straight going to steam afterward? If it's already clean, I would go to steam right after because then you don't have to worry about water being in the pores and then increasing that differential pressure. So if that cartridge is completely dry, it's been left overnight, and you apply steam, you'll see zero pressure buildup. That steam will just go right through the cartridge, assuming your condensate's drained. You want to make sure your condensate's all, all drained off. Um, so I would recommend that you go directly to steam there. Clean the previous night and then go to steam. So the next uh, section goes through integrity testing. You know, keeping with the theme of all the sessions as far as uh, quality and micro assurance, this is what allows the filter to have that, that uh, you know, to allow it to reliably remove microbes. It's the fact that you can check it. Very few processes have a built-in method that doesn't destroy the, the, the step or is, can be done uh, right there in the winery to make sure that it's running efficiently and effectively. So integrity running an integrity test not only picks up any defects in the filter, any damage to the filter, it also picks up improper installation, damaged O-rings. It also checks the hardware around the filter. It makes sure the domed base plate uh, O-ring is okay, any internal O-rings are okay, there's no leaky valves, there's, there's nothing faulty with the hardware. So it's not just working around the filter, and it's important to remember if you ever have an integrity test issue, it may not necessarily be the filter, it may be hardware related around there. The other good thing that a lot of uh, wineries uh, find with integrity testing, integrity test specifications are built around a specific filter. So a lot of the wineries, especially in this area, will use 0.45 micron and 0.65 micron filters. Some use a 1.0 micron filter. Outside of the printing on the top of it, it's difficult to tell which is which. A lot of customers also have difficulty looking at which one's a pre-filter, which one's a final filter. Pre-filters aren't integrity testable. It's not uncommon for us to get a, a call from a facility that has a, an eight or 12 round housing. They can't get it to pass integrity. We go in there and there's a pre-filter in the middle of the housing and the rest are final filters. Uh, so that it makes sure that the correct filter is being used. If you wanna use a 0.45 on certain wines and a 0.65 on other wines, this makes sure that you're using the right filter on that particular wine. So it doesn't just te test the, uh, the fact that the uh, filter is working correctly. But in your experience, in, in my experience of changing filters, it seems to me that I think in all my years of doing it, I've had a bad, a truly bad filter cartridge, mm -hmm. I think once. The, most of the time what happens is it's always the O-ring on the bottom, yeah. or it's an O-ring in the house, yeah. that I was actually able to identify, okay, this was pinched or something like that when it was put in. I think I've only had one key. I mean, is that what you see too? I mean, most of the time, it shouldn't happen. You you should ne with these filters. You should never have an integrity failure. And if you ever do have a true integrity failure, we want to know about it. We'll take the filter back. We have a setup in Fresno that'll check the filters. Millipore takes them back, and Millipore builds that into a database. Uh, these Vitapore two filters are the number one filter in not just in the U.S. for, for wine, but globally for wine, beer, and, and water. Uh, number one in Japan, Asia, Europe. So they sell tens of, actually hundreds of thousands of these filters to wineries. And that goes into quality programs and, and improving the product. Uh, for instance, uh, this last, this new filter, uh, the Vitapore 2, that was released about six years ago, the number one area, uh, if you use any competitive filters, uh, where those filters will damage and you'll have a true integrity failure, is where the soft, pliable membrane uh, bonds into the hard plastic of the end cap. With all the shear that goes back and forth, that, causes, that can cause a separation of the pleat pack to the end cap. So Millipore, six years ago, looked at that, came up with a new patented end cap it allows for about four times as deeper potting to eliminate that. Since that has went into effect, what's really the number one cause industry-wide of true integrity failures, we haven't seen one in six years. So to answer your question on if a filter should fail, absolutely should not fail. Your filter should, end of life, should be determined by throughput. It should never be determined by integrity. If you have an integrity failure, we'll always want to hear about it. 
They are. Uh, in some cases, their integrity test is up to three times. And Millipore uses a proprietary gas. Uh, so we'll get into that in a little bit. But in a nutshell, um, every foot of membrane is tested. Every 10-inch element is tested. And then if that 10-inch element is put into a larger cartridge, the entire cartridge is tested. And it uses a gas, not water. Um, which is a pretty expensive process, so not everybody does it, but what that does is that eliminates membrane defects. So that has some good implications when we're talking about the specifications and running uh, integrity tests. Uh, for instance, the bubble point specification is 28 pounds pressure. We get a lot of calls from customers that say my, my bubble point was 26 or 27 pounds. In any instance, that filter is good. Any failure, true failure of an integrity test is going to be a gross failure. A bubble point will fail right at two or three pounds. If you're doing a pressure hold, that entire pressure will bleed right off in a matter of of seconds as opposed to the 10 minute time of the test. So since we can reliably say there's no membrane defects, you'll never have a borderline integrity test. So that, that has some, some good implications if you ever have imprecise gauges or if you're ever worried about a, a slightly passing integrity test, it's always gonna be fine. Um, so yeah, Millipore does do that with, uh, with the gas. Uh, so on the next slide, we have some of the, the common causes of, of integrity failure and you'll see that most of them aren't related to actual filter itself. Most of them are related to shipping or, or other things. Um, so just going back to this, uh, when to perform an integrity test, always on install. Probably 85% of your integrity failures are going to be on install. It's going to be due to that air bubble um, not causing the filter to wet out. It's going to be due to a rolled O-ring or uh, the wrong filter being installed. That's the vast majority of when your uh, integrity is going to fail. Also after cleaning and sanitation, as we talked about with that pressure tolerance going down for the cartridge at, at a higher temperature, if there ever is going to be damage, it's usually going to be related to cleaning or sanitation. I can't think of a time when I've ever seen a filter that's actually failed during a run. It's always sometime outside of the run. So there's a little bit of a discussion in industry and customers do things a little bit different as far as when they do their integrity test. Some customers will do their run, perform an integrity test, do their cleaning and sanitation and perform another integrity test. That way you're isolating out those two points, those two uh, uh, parts of the process. So you know if you, there is a failure, if it was due to the cleaning or sanitation or if it was actually due to the, due to the, uh, the wine run. Other customers will do their wine run, do their cleaning and sanitation, and then do an integrity test. If you do have an in-bottle micro hit right there, you now have to hold that product and you have to worry about um, going back and testing various bottles to try to track down where that hold might have been or just wait for, uh, for, for more information to come back. So, but you do save uh, an additional integrity test there. So both ways have their benefits, but uh, those are kind of the two thoughts around when do integrity test during a run. Uh, after long-term storage, most times you're going to do a sterilization after storage, so you'll integrity test anyway. And also when there's any micro counts that are showing up in the bottle. One of the good things about membrane filters is it offers kind of a, a brick wall as far as where to troubleshoot. If that filter comes back with a, with a passing integrity result, you know that micro hit is happening after the filter, some, somewhere, before, somewhere to the filler. You know you can rule out anything filter back. So you look at your filler sanitation, opening and closing your, your uh, valves during sanitation, all of those kind of hot points that we, that we typically see. But if the filter passes integrity, there's no uh, filter pass integrity and let some microbes through. There's no it passed one time and something bounced back into place and now it's, it's failing. Either filter is integral or it's not integral. Either it'll pass or it won't pass. And you know if it's passing, nothing's going downstream of the filters and you need to focus uh, uh, your sanitation checks uh, farther downstream. So there's three types of, of integrity tests that are, that are typically used, the bubble point, the diffusion, and the pressure hold. They all work with the same basic principle, the fact that a membrane has an affinity for water. The membranes used are hydrophobic. They hold on to that water uh, until a specified pressure. Uh, in the case of bubble point, what you're measuring, you're measuring the pressure it takes to push that water out. With a 0.45 vitipore 2, it's 28 pounds pressure. So until you hit that, if the membrane's fully integral, if there's no defects, holes, tears, anything like that, you will not see any air pass through that membrane until you reach 28 PSI or higher. And as you can see, bubble point is a function of the membrane. So each membrane has a different bubble point. And this is how you can uh, check if the correct membrane is in, is in the housing. One thing about bubble point though is bubble point does not matter how much membrane is in the housing. You, a bubble point is the same for a 10 inch, a 30 inch, and also a three round. We typically recommend bubble point for three round housings and under. Um, above that, you can still use bubble point. There's some customers that use them upwards of eight rounds, but it, it does have some issues with, uh, with uh, it's, it's easier to prematurely push the water out. So we recommend a pressure hold or a diffusion test if you're above a three round, which goes into the next type. So the next type of integrity test 
is the diffusional flow. This is the most sensitive type of integrity test. This is what, you're, if you, anybody's using an automatic integrity tester, this is what they're measuring and this is what the pharmaceutical industry measures. It starts off with that same principle that the uh, membrane retains water, but it adds in a second portion being that uh, if there's a high concentration of gas molecules upstream uh, and then the downstream is open to atmosphere so it has a low concentration of gas molecules, that air, those air molecules are going to dissolve into the water, travel through the water, and then uh, end up in the downstream. So with diffusional flow, you're actually measuring the amount of air that goes downstream of the, uh, of the pores. And again, if the filter is integral, it's a very specific amount of air that travels downstream. Usually it's, the specification is given in uh, mils per minute at a test pressure. The test pressure for these two types of, of uh, integrity tests, you'll notice, is always about 80% of, of uh, the uh, bubble point. You don't want to put this test pressure too close to the bubble point in case when you're increasing your regulator, you accidentally push water out and now you have to re-wet in order to do the test. Um, I'll also make the point, we get a lot of questions in the wine industry as far as nitrogen, argon, argon and other gases. On bubble point, there's no difference. The pressure is the pressure, whether that pressure is air, nitrogen, or, or anything else. With diffusion, since you're measuring the diffusion of a specific type of molecule, that is different. So we would have to run a calculation if you wanted to do diffusion tests on nitrogen or something else, which it's pretty easy to do. Just let us know and we'll, we'll figure that out for you. So in pharmaceutical, it it, it's kind of, but this to do in a winery, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a special apparatus. You have to collect the air that's passing through. It takes a, long, a lot of time and effort. So what's used in beverage is a variation of that uh, called pressure hold testing. So instead of leaving the gas on for the entire 10 minutes of the test and measuring the amount of gas that's passing downstream, you shut the gas off and you watch the drop in pressure as, that, as those gas molecules move downstream and now leave the atmosphere, the gauge pressure drops and you can measure how much gas is left that method. And that's really the, the most common method for anything above a three round housing that's used in beverage. Over that. The typical specification is around two PSI, but as we already mentioned, the uh, any true integrity failure will be a gross hold test. Millipore did some uh, tests in support of a winery where they took a fine gauge diabetic needle, which is pretty much the, the finest ga gauge need needle you can get, and they poked a single hole in a filter in a 12 round housing and ran bubble points and uh, diffusions. The bubble point blew out at like two PSI and the pressure hold within a matter of 30 seconds, all the pressure was gone off the housing. Didn't get anywhere near the typical specification of two to five over 10 minutes, let alone you know, anything even remotely close. So even the slightest nick in an O-ring, even the slightest hole in a large housing, you'll still have a gross failure. So that's why most customers won't calculate out the exact specification. They'll use a blanket five PSI specification, which is easier to read on gauges. If you're working with a one and a half PSI or a two PSI specification, that can be tricky and that can be pretty variable on a gauge to watch. You have to make sure you have real accurate gauges and, and uh, um, real, uh, you know, real, real, uh, calibrated gauges. Good. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with using a blanket specification. Using a blanket specification also helps out in that if you have different filters, 0.45s, 0.65s, or if you have different size housings, you can use the same specification for each one rather than having the operator memorize a different specification for each housing. I think we already went over the procedure. So going into most IT failures, most IT failures Typically 80% are due to cartridges not being properly wetted, especially right out of the box. The first time they're wetted, it takes a little bit more back pressure. Sometimes they, they're not fully wetted out. That, that's the most common, uh, common cause. The other common cause is rolled O-rings. We get a lot of people ask us why do cartridges have two O-rings. The reason is any, uh, a particular, on any particular installation, each O-ring has about a 5% chance of rolling. So if you add two O-rings to the cartridge, you have a 5% chance of a 5% chance of rolling both O-rings and having a, a non-integral filter, which is, means it'll occur in about one every 400 cartridge installs. So it still does happen though. On a 12 round, especially on multi rounds, that means it'll happen about every 33 setups that you need to take all those filters out and reinstall them and that'll eliminate the rolled O-ring. You can wet the O-rings on install with, with uh, wine or water, really anything. Just to add a slight bit of lubrication really helps that out and helps the install and, and means they won't roll as even as often, but it's still something that, that occurs. Uh, valve issues is another common one. A faulty valves, you know, they have to be rebuilt. They have seals in there. You have to worry about valve issues. Always re-wet and retest the filters the first time. You always have to, to have to check that first, and that'll take care of most IT failures. Your second step should be to pull out all cartridges, inspect them, reinstall, and re-wet. Uh, if there's any, ever been any damage, one of the other common ins, 
uh, instances of cartridges being uh, damaged is during shipping. UPS and FedEx are notorious for breaking cartridges. If you see any box damage, always check out the cartridge. Really do good inspection. A lot of times, cartridge, you'll be able to spot something that happened in shipping before you go through the hassle of wetting and integrity testing the filters. Probably the trickiest IT failure that is along these lines that gives customers a lot of headaches and a lot of hard times is the cartridges come in double poly bags. And operators have a tendency to want to open those with box cutters and razor blades. And it doesn't take a lot of force or a lot to nick go through one of those windows and nick the membrane. Even a slight touch may cut the membrane, and that's not something you're easily going to see on an inspection. You're not going to be able to look at every single one of those windows. Middleport gets a lot of cartridges back that have just a perfectly little little slice in them, and they know it's automatically due to, uh, due to a razor blade. And since you can't see it, that's one that'll really give you a lot of headaches. A lot of customers now have dedicated scissors so you can cut open the box or cut open the top of the bag or they'll ban box cutters and razor blades from opening the cartridges. They have to open them by hand because that is one of the, unfortunately, one of the most common issues. And it's, a special, it's an expensive piece of, of uh, you know, it's an expensive cartridge so you hate to damage it with a razor blade like that. So as we already mentioned, the Vitaport 2 is a double integrity tested. So the cartridge, if it's a multi if it's a if it's a multi-element cartridge, is double integrity tested. The membrane is also integrity tested by the foot. So no uh, membrane defects leave the plant. Uh, also, always carefully inspect the shipping boxes. And again, your filter end of life should always be determined by throughput. If you have regular IT failures, something's wrong. We want to come in and help you out and troubleshoot that. You really even shouldn't have any periodic integrity failures. To your point of only having one in in uh, what you made it sound like many years of, of running there, they shouldn't happen. I mean, there's customers who run filters on multi-rounds 10, 20 years and have never had a true IT failure. It actually gets to the point where some customers get nervous when they see a marginal bubble point or when they see the filter acting in a strange way because they've never seen a real failure. If you ever see a real failure and you run an integrity test, you know in about five seconds. It's completely different from anything else. Um, so some customers see them so infrequently or have never seen them, they don't quite know what to what to make of normal things when, they, when it goes on. Again, we'll go over the, uh, the throughput again. We always recommend 100,000, or we, we would like to customers, rather, to get 100,000 gallons throughput through each setup, uh, through each Vitaport 2, and you always want to track your throughput. As I said, this is kind of the high point, 300,000 gallons per 30 inch, 3 million per 12 round. That's the highest we've seen. That customer gets it regularly, and that's rare, but you can really optimize and reduce a lot of your costs. And that's it. Any other questions? Go ahead. Any uh, recommendation for um, long-term storage? Long -term storage? What, we recommendation methods? what I think is the best, uh, especially it, it depends if it's in the housing or out of the housing. Usually long-term storage is going to be out of the housing. What I think works best and what more people are starting to use now is ethanol. So just 40%, uh, essentially vodka. Uh, you put that in there. The good thing about that is it does a great job at, at uh, sterilizing the filters. Uh, it's pretty easy to come by and you don't have to refresh it. With a lot of solutions like paracetic acid or sodium metabisulfite, by sulfite, you have to change that solution every two weeks or a month in order to uh, keep it effective. Ethanol, you don't have to. And ethanol, you can reuse. You can take the filter out, cap it off, put, the, put another filter back in there later on. So that's usually what I recommend. We have a data sheet up on our website, though, that, and also in our catalog has a couple paragraphs that give other concentrations and, and options for filter storage. But that's usually the best. The only thing with that and with all cartridge storage, you want to make sure you remove the O-rings. The O-rings over time, long time in ethanol, will start to swell. And then when you put them in, they'll shrink and you may get cracks in there. So just store the O-rings separately on a shelf somewhere. Anything else? No? Okay, thank you guys. Uh, I've got some cards up here too. Uh